Hi everyone, I'm Ali Fodi. I'm a program officer with the New York Health Foundation in our Empowering Healthcare Consumers Portfolio area. Today, I'm so pleased to have you with us. Today, we're here to talk about telehealth. Telehealth as the new normal in healthcare. At the height of the pandemic, telehealth was the modality for us seeking care. Now as facilities reopen, use has waned, but it's a tool in our toolkit. It is an option for patients seeking care. And we're here today to discuss when are the times when those options are really at play when telehealth is the appropriate way of seeking care for patients who want and need it. What are the barriers to telehealth use? And importantly, our partners here have innovative projects to share around using navigators as trusted partners in helping patients access telehealth and doing so equitably. So I'm so excited to have them share their work with us, we have Keenan Katraji, Senior Director of Digital Health at New York City Health and Hospitals, Urbshi Pandya, Director of Programs at Air NYC, and Chris Joseph, Executive Director at Engagewell IPA. Those names and titles could not do them justice. Look them up on LinkedIn. Their bios are distinguished. But we're here to have them share their work. As for our run of show today, they will do a brief overview of their telehealth navigation projects. It's just designed to be a basic orientation to their work. It could not do justice to the intention and the impressive execution of these projects, but we'll reserve the majority of our time for a conversation to pose our panelists questions about the lessons that they've learned along the way. We want this to be really interactive and engaged. So please put your questions, your comments, your thoughts, your contact information in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that. I'll pose your questions to our panelists and I'll glean themes from those in the interest of time among common questions. So we will go ahead and dig right in. Before I do, just a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, many thanks to my colleague Michelle and the rest of our communications team for making this webinar happen. Uh, we do have closed captioning available, so you'll see that option at the bottom of your screen and at the banner at the top. We'll be recording our session and we'll share a recap following our webinar, including the slides that you'll see here today. So with all of that, I will say we're excited to dig in and I'll first pass it on to Keenan to get us oriented to Health and Hospitals program. Hey everyone. Uh, thank you so much for New York Health Foundation, well, for everything and um, for inviting us here to talk about this exciting program. Um, We've personally got a lot out of this program and, and it's inspired um, sort of many other um, adjustments to our other telehealth navigation programs and um, has advanced us a lot. So uh, we have a lot, uh, a lot to learn and I'll try to compress as much as I can in, in the next five minutes and hopefully we can have a nice chat as well um, and talk about um, some of the, the, the great value that this program has brought to, brought to us. Um, just a little bit of a table setting to understand where the problem came from. And I'm sure you guys are all aware, but uh, we'll speak to it from our perspective. Um, here you see, I mean, before COVID-19, there was about 500 uh, 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 visits in the three weeks prior. Um, and then suddenly after COVID-19 and shutdown, uh, suddenly we have to adapt um, and we have to scale a whole new workflow, a whole new model um, uh, uh, on the fly. So we're just sort of patching systems and 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 building systems on the go. And um, and we're trying to accommodate patients who have a lot of questions and, and, a, and a lot of issues that um, that need solving. Uh, so this is uh, this is a really, really uh, busy time for all the folks at H&H. &H, um, uh, Hannah Jackson, who's our AVP, Kevin Chen, um, the, all, all these folks really did their, uh, a lot of great work to stand all of this up. And you can see how things exponentially have been increasing. And, and here we have our, our new norm. But what happened was, is we stood up this system and um, we didn't really understand all the sort of um, uh, the, 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 the waves that sort of expanded from this new uh, workflow. Uh, so we know we could connect a patient and a provider, but how, do, how, how, how can we best improve the patient experience? And really, how do we understand the patient, ex uh, the, the experience from our patient's perspective? Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we know that there's a technology out there, but how, how do our patients understand it? What do they think about it? 
um, and how um, what are their challenges getting onto it? Because uh, some folks are able to get on quite easily and it's intuitive, but other folks um, may have a huge technology barrier. Uh, there may be resource constraints. Uh, so how do we listen to those voices um, after such a you know a, a rapidly a, a rapid event, um, a big event? <laughs> um, so uh, our plan was to hire these two FTEs and support and, and rotate them across our, uh, our, our facilities. Uh, we were targeting about eight, eight uh, acute hospitals who, that also have a, uh, outpatient centers and to sort of sit them in the adult primary care uh, uh, waiting rooms and, and be sort of a channel uh, of feedback for us, uh, really to engage the patients as they come in to understand how they view video visits and telehealth in general, to give them the resources that they need uh, in term, uh, and, and, under, and understand sort of uh, maybe our blind spots and things that we, we haven't even thought of. Uh, so this was uh, a, 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 our way of sort of reaching out to our community uh, to uncover these barriers and hopefully impl implement solutions. And, and I will say, I think we've, we've come so far uh, and this became a resource not not only for our patients in our in our waiting rooms, but it really became a resources from from our providers too. So when we were thinking of this program, we were saying, "Oh, okay, like we really need to understand the patients," and, and we did. Um, but um, we also didn't understand that our our providers' uh, biases towards the system as well. Um, so uh, th that became a huge uh, impact. Um, as well as as with our patients. And then another thing that we layered on top of this was an engagement with our uh, community-based organizations. These are uh, 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 organizations that represent uh, certain uh, uh, diverse community groups. And, and we really listened to their input. And um, uh, one of, one of the, the biggest takeaways as I sort of approach uh, wrapping up here uh, was uh, what we learned from a lot of the immigrant communities. Uh, it was that telehealth was something that was looked at as sort of a, a lesser form of, of, of health care. So that was something for us to address immediately in that, you know, you, you know, how do we present the value of telehealth? We have to be very upfront. We have to address these concerns that they're not being passed off uh, when, a, when a provider says, hey, let's, let's meet next time over a video. Uh, let's address those concerns and, and, and make sure that they understand that this is, we can still take care of them in this time. Um, so uh, yeah, so the, a lot of a lot of great, great, great uh, takeaways from this program. And as we wrap up, um, and uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to chat about it more. <laughs> I see my five minutes are up. So <laughs> thanks, Keenan. Don't worry, our questions will tee you up to share all of the all the lessons <laughs> you've learned and all the the great findings from your project. Uh, thank you, and Urvashi, I'll pass it along to you. Sure, and Keenan, it was great to hear about the H and H program. I'm going to go ahead and share a deck that I have here. All right, so I'm really excited to um, share with you all today some of um, the program um, learnings that we've had from implementing this um, community health worker telehealth equity nav navigation program over the past year. And thank you to New York Health Foundation for allowing us to share um, this work with you all today. Um, to give you a brief orientation to ARNYC, um, ARNYC really, um, we use community health workers to meet people where they are to um, connect them to care and build health equity at multiple levels, the individual, family, and community levels. A brief history of who we are, we were first established in 2001 as a community-based participatory research project in partnership with Harlem Hospital. Millman School of Public Health and Harlem Children's Zone, and our work was really rooted in pediatric asthma. Um, we launched as an independent CBO in 2011, and over the years, we've expanded our work to include all age ranges, works from all across New York City, and we now work across multiple chronic conditions in addition to other emergent um, healthcare needs that uh, we've noted from the community, and we work with a range of partners as well. So this slide here just um, gives you an overview of our approach across all of our programs. And of course, this is embedded in this program as well. Um, the underlying thread here is really meeting people where they are in the way that's most convenient for them, whether it's by phone, by text, uh, video, call, or even in person. And um, using the language and cultural competency that um, 
our staff has to really connect with the patients, build trust and identify what their needs are. So always centering um, their needs and removing any barriers that they may have to care, including um, their social needs and tracking those and sharing those out so we can better understand um, what's working and what's not. So our telehealth um, navigation program was conducted in conjunction with Sun River Health of QHC. And I wanted to give a shout out to Colleen Blake, who's joining us from Sun River Health uh, this morning, as well as um, the ARNYC team who's been involved in this project. Uh, one of our community health workers is also joining, who's on this program, Mariam Abbas. So I just wanna say thank you for joining. Um, our program was striving to reduce barriers to health and social care through enhanced access to and facility with telehealth and virtual care while centering patient choice so that um, patient choice kind of comes up over and over again with sort of two tracks, one um, that's a lighter touch um, based on what the patient wanted or um, deeper care coordination. And we serve patients um, in the Bronx with asthma, COPD and or hypertension many with a history, a high history of no show to appointments. So the connections back to care were imperative here with this uh, group that we work with. And um, we outreach folks to um, understand what their needs were at the moment, whether they wanted deeper care coordination or they just simply wanted to be connected back to care. Um, the intervention also included prescription navigation, um, of course, telehealth navigation, health coaching and social needs navigation. So just some general program highlights of what we've learned over the past year. Um, we've definitely been able to build a really strong relationship with Sun River Health, and this has been imperative to the success of the program. Um, really the buy-in from Sun River Health across multiple levels from the executive level all the way down to the clinic level has really ensured that the operations of this program um, run smoothly and we're able to really partner to um, ensure the success of the program and make sure that patients get what they need. Um, another really great aspect of the program is that the community health workers have been embedded in Sun River Health's EMR, allowing them to um, directly communicate with patients' providers and their care team for that um, bi-directional communication and reinforcing care plans, um, scheduling appointments, um, CHWs are able to web enable patients to access Sun River's patient portal, um, so all of this has been really great. And you see a couple of percentages here on the um, slide indicating um, for the patients that we screened, how many of those wanted that kind of navigation assistance from this community health worker. Another thing I'll point out here is that they had access to a tool called Luma for appointment scheduling, which allowed community health workers to really teach patients how to go in and directly set up an appointment for themselves, even if they didn't have the patient portal. So that was really great. And then also when applicable, um, we were able to refer uh, patients to health homes and that really allowed us to focus on providing care coordination to those that were not eligible for that. And of course the underlying um, thread here is that we're noticing again and again, um, social needs of patients uh, were coming up and I didn't include all of that on this slide here, but of course, um, comes as no surprise, uh, the top kind of social needs identified by community health workers were emergency food needs, as well as housing needs as related to um, rental arrears, uh, legal issues with the landlord or structural issues in the home. I have a patient story here, but just to, um, you know, for the sake of time, um, I will share these slides later, but this is a story kind of embodying the work of this program. Um, so, I hope you all get a chance to take a look at this later because it's really wonderful. And I'll say, Irvisi, the stories that you've shared with us around what this means for patients in managing their asthma and addressing social needs beyond through the help of navigators, it's it just is a real testament to your work. So I'd encourage everyone to check out the slides after our session. Thank you, Irvisi. Thanks for our rock star CHWs involved at Air NYC and our Sun River colleagues for joining us. Chris, with that, I'll pass it off to you.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ali. And just so exciting to see those slides uh, <laughs> and hear about the work that you all are doing at RNYC and Health and Hospitals. Uh, so, you know, I just want to start my little brief presentation with that. We are just about to launch this really exciting project uh, where we're using peer educators, not the traditional CHW in that regard, as digital health ambassadors. Um, and so just I'll be talking about what we have had to consider as we planned this project with um, support from New York Health Foundation. So again, thank you, Ali, for the support there. Um, a little bit about the Engage Well IPA. For those who don't know what an IPA is, it stands for Independent Practice Association or Independent Provider Association. It's a fancy word for network or consortium of people work, uh, of agencies working together. We are currently 16 participating providers strong. Those are listed um, on the screen here. Uh, these are longstanding uh, agencies in, in the community uh, throughout the New York City metropolitan area, many of whom got their start in, in direct response as grassroots response to HIV AIDS when uh, the healthcare system and the social net safety system was failing our, our, our communities. And so um, as HIV has become more of a chronic condition, many have switched their focus or, or, or shifted their focus to more chronic disease management model. Um, uniquely, our, our network serves, uh, provides primary care services, behavioral health, outpatient services, and a slew of social services. Um, I could speak for hours <laughs> on the, the amazing work that my network does. Um, most recently, and I wanted to highlight this, is we are a State Designated Behavioral Health Care Collaborative, or a BHCC, well, so, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, it, it's challenging us to think about how do we, as community-based um, outpatient providers, improve quality of behavioral health care specifically, and to negotiate value-based payment contracts. And again, I could speak for hours about value-based payment contracting, but in short, if we can come up with an innovative solution that reduces cost of care, the network thereby shares in the savings from the healthcare system. Uh, so we are a startup. Uh, I think that's really exciting for us. Uh, we've been around for about five years. These agencies have been <laughs> around for 30 plus years. Um, but so a lot of the work we're doing is new and innovative and exciting, um, but it is a wild ride. So we uh, will be talking more in detail today about our, what we're calling our Carrier Way Demonstration Project. This is an integrated care model uh, that will uh, leverage CHWs and peers um, for peer support and digital health ambassadors. So how can we bring the strengths of our medical and behavioral health providers to patients virtually we'll, uh, through traditional telehealth um, solutions, but also through two innovative smartphone applications, one that um, provides uh, small financial incentives for medication adherence, and one that addresses uh, hunger and malnutrition through home-delivered food boxes. And so both of those are smartphone-based applications. And so when you start talking about resources and how do you get uh, you know, high-quality smartphones into the hands of, of low-income or, or, or marginalized communities, that's one of the barriers that we are are trying to solve for here. Uh, but we're really excited because I think that this is work we've been doing uh, in, indirectly for many years. And now we have our eyes on the 1115 waiver um, with foundation support um, from a variety of foundations, some small managed care support, and uh, surprisingly support from the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, we are being able to launch this three-year demonstration project. It's a big project. Um, I'm joined by my colleague Cheyenne on this uh, webinar today, so uh, it's going to be uh, uh, not for the faint of heart <laughs> navigating this project, but um, we're excited that uh, it's really allowing us to innovate and bring to our nonprofits a really exciting opportunity to see how new technology can evaluate um, or impact patient provider satisfaction, health outcomes, and healthcare spending. Um, with New York Health Foundation uh, funds, we are um, we have uh, are contracting with Alliance for Positive Change, one of our nonprofit organizations, who will hire peer uh, advocates or peer educators as digital health ambassadors, and uh, they are being charged with uh, supporting not only the clients enrolled in the smartphone applications at their own agency, but that eight other agencies who are participating in these new uh, technologies. And so this is really what we're planning for. It's a shared staffing model that an IPA, it's, it's one of the services an IPA can provide its network. This will be new for us. And so we're really excited about the opportunity to, to evaluate and learn uh, how this adds value to our network. And I will uh, stop sharing now. <laughs>
Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much for teeing up this exciting model on the horizon. And I see that we have some Engageable IPA members with us as well. So thank you for being with us as participants and, and to your team, Cheyenne, and otherwise. All right. Well, everyone, I'm appreciative that you're all putting your names and your contact information in the chat. Keep that up so we can know who to connect with. Uh, and so I will and also keep posing questions in the chat. I'll be pulling those into our conversation as well. I'm going to get us started off with a question around the role of navigators. Navigators make the magic happen with these projects. And in each of your projects, navigators can look differently. They're community health workers, peer educators, patient portal liaisons. But through them all, there are hallmarks of what makes an effective navigator. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts as to what makes an effective navigator, patient navigator, especially in the context of helping patients use telehealth and other forms of technology to manage their health and care. So uh, let's see here, how do we wanna go? Keenan, why don't you go ahead and kick us off and then uh, others feel free to chime in as thoughts occur to you. Yeah, sure. Um, I will say we have the pleasure of having two great navigators and we have one that's uh, you know above and beyond excellent. Um, I think uh, really what we find is that the navigator, the, the, the most successful trait of a navigator is sort is the ability to sort of embed themselves into the ecosystem of a clinic and that takes somebody with uh, a little bit more uh, extroverted like a little more empathetic towards both the patient and the provider and somebody who really asks really good questions and and wants to understand processes through and through the the temptation with navigators in this space is to sort of uh, you know, really look for somebody who has a long, large experience in digital health or understands tech or maybe a techie. Uh, while I think that's like certainly a good foundation, I think really the the connection with the user is the most important thing. And and really that, that'll help them sort of excavate the issues that these users are having um, and uh, sort of uh, 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 run those back up. So it was... Um, one thing that we, we felt was 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 uh, very important in a, in a navigator. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with you, Keenan. And something else that um, we also think makes a navigator particularly effective is their ability, right? That that connection piece, being able to connect with the patient and being able to gauge the patient's comfort with um, technology, so their um, tech literacy. I think that um, our community health workers do a really good job of understanding um, where the patient is at in terms of being able to connect to telehealth and telehealth that can be broader than just the telehealth visit, right? It's the lead up to the visit, it's setting up the appointment, making sure they're able to get there, um, making sure that they're able to connect, but also it can look like um, connecting to a patient portal or understanding how to like communicate with their providers. So it's a full range of things, right? Um, the other thing is that if we feel like a patient is um, not comfortable with technology themselves, but they have somebody else in their home or in their community that could support them in using tech, um, you know, community health workers get really creative um, and they're like, oh, do you have, um, you know, somebody like a caregiver or somebody in the home that could help you out? Um, so we'll use that as a resource as well to just get them started and really assessing their comfort level to at least just start them on a path to getting to that point where they're comfortable. So for example, if a community health worker is talking to a patient and they're not yet comfortable with setting up their patient portal or delving into a telehealth visit yet, um, maybe the barrier or the lowest point of entry is maybe starting with something like Luma where it's a simple process to, um, you know, if they feel comfortable to click on the link and um, schedule an appointment, the community health worker can actually share their screen and show them how to schedule an appointment if they can you know, do that. So it's really getting creative, understanding um, what the patient is comfortable with at the time. I think another thing that um, makes our community health workers particularly effective as navigators is maybe um, they're viewed as being independent um, outside of the healthcare system. So that helps them connect to the patients as well. Um, and I think it's helpful that community health workers have extra time that providers don't necessarily have in the exam room to, um, you know, have that additional um, time with the patient to explain everything. So, of course, the, um, the gift of time helps as well. 
Yeah, I, I agree with everything Vashi and Keenan have said. Um, the Alliance for Positive Change, who will be leading this project for us, has been kind of at the forefront of peer educators over the last 25 years, specifically in the HIV space, and have trained and, and, and supported um, peers with um, a variety of lived experience that matches our community population, so mental health, substance use disorders, uh, criminal justice involvement, etc. Um, for this particular project, they already are thinking about who are the right peers for this project. So who are peers that have experience with telehealth? Um, they will be specifically trained by the two smartphone applications that we are partnering with because we want them to be very comfortable with that tool. Um, in our partnership with uh, Columbia University, they, they reminded me that you know, oftentimes when we get into these type, uh, types of projects and new technologies and, and, and projects where patients are being asked to share, you know, private health information in a, in a smartphone, you know, anticipating um, questions and we'll be training our peers to answer these questions around why is this data being collected? Why is my, why do you need to know my diagnoses or, or why do you need to come to my home or why do you need my address? What's, where's that data going? How is it being used? There is, you know, medical mistrust that is, uh, is prevalent in um, communities of color and, and rightfully so. Um, and so, you know, we're thinking a little bit about this more uh, holistically, not only are the, are the peers needing to be um, confident in the tools we're giving them, but also, um, uh, pulling in some of that medical mistrust and, 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 and privacy concerns and, and those kinds of things. So uh, I would also add that our peers will be community-based, and so they will be bringing smartphones to clients, helping that clients set up the smartphone through our partnership with T-Mobile. We're luckily able to do that because we realize that in the, if, if we're going to prove the concept for these kinds of innovations, we can't just work with clients who have the resources today, we have to make sure that we can provide the resources. So T-Mobile has been uh, a great partner there. But yeah, helping set up the phone, download the app, set up a profile. There's a lot of work that goes into the pre, to your point, Yavashi, before they even begin using the app. And then it's not like a one and done. Like these are apps where patients will be um, ordering food every two weeks or an answering assessments in the app, um, taking pictures and uploading pictures. And so there is a lot of just basic skills around digital health literacy that will go into our project that our peers uh, who will be supporting uh, clients will need to know how to do and, and coach. Thank you, everyone. All right, I love that we're seeing a lot of good questions here in the chat. I'm going to sprinkle those in and know that I'm taking all of them down, so we'll get to them over the course of our conversation. But we have one most recently around the type of training. If, can you share more about the training that you or your partners are providing to CHW's peer educators and otherwise, so that they can wear both of those hats of a trusted care team member that's primed to connect interpersonally and also knows about how to wade through the technology in a way that can assist patients and providers. So what type of training are you and your partners using to equip CHWs and peer educators with the tools they need to play in this navigator role? See, Chris, why don't you go ahead and get started or yeah, I, the Alliance's plans? And then yeah, yeah. On. So yeah, the, 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 the peers, um, different from CHWs in, is that there are kind of two levels of peers in the space, the behavioral health space. There are credentialed peers, and then there are peers that are just good at what they do. They're able to connect with patients. And so some of that is innate, right? But there are um, formal trainings that peers can can go through or do go through at the Alliance for Positive Change um, around community engagement, how, you know, trauma-informed care, harm reduction. So there are formal trainings that they go through. As it relates to this particular project, um, we will be uh, leveraging the digital health companies that we are partnering with to co-lead those trainings. So um, one of those programs is Wealth. It's a medication adherence application that uses a smartphone to take pictures of the medication. So they will be there to help train um, and uh, tangible Low, which is a food platform where patients can order food. What's unique about that platform is you can use your SNAP benefits as well to order your food. So training, it's going to be interesting to, to train or, or import, sorry, interesting, important to train the peers to teach patients how to upload their SNAP benefits and track that. So it is, there will be some nitty gritty uh, detail specific to each application. And then of course, activating a smartphone, you know, so Timo will be involved in that. So the IPA who is negotiating those contracts and, and leading the kind of learning collaboratives for the network uh, will be helping train the peers regarding some of the hard skills that are needed to to use these um, to use these tools. 
Yeah, I can speak to the training that our community health workers receive. So um, we really see the community health worker as the expert in being able to connect and understanding the community. But beyond that, we provide supportive training um, in motivational interviewing. That one is key um, because that's really how we like to approach conversations with patients that we work with. Um, resource navigation is a training that all community health workers receive. So understanding what the resources are and um, how to facilitate referrals to those resources. Um, foundations of public health, including health equity, health disparities, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, social determinants of health, um, you know, and continuous learning on COVID-19, um, as well as communication skills and de-escalation skills. Um, so that's, that's part of the kind of foundational um, training that community health workers will receive, but specifically to this project, what was really helpful was for us to receive training from Sun River Health on um, all of their um, platforms. So ahead of the launch of the project, um, community health workers are trained in their um, EMR, ECW, to really understand like all the different components that go in there, right? How to send messages to providers, how to request prescription refills. And that level of trust that um, was afforded to us is really, really helpful because it's helped to expedite that um, the escalation of needs for patients. Additionally, kind of training on their patient portal, uh, being able to have a test environment to play around in ahead of time, which really allows us to walk the patient through step-by-step um, -step setting up a patient portal account, as well as um, receiving training on Luma. So every step of the way, right, we, we felt prepared and supported by Summer for Health to be able to um, provide that information to patients as well. From H&H's uh, uh, perspective, uh, we are we are uh, lucky to have sort of Epic and MyChart training, uh, MyChart being the, the patient portal for Epic um, already built in. So we had our uh, uh, telehealth navigators go through uh, sort of uh, uh, clinical su supplement uh, um, Epic and MyChart training. Um, but what I love is what Urvashi just talked about was training the CHWs on, you know, motivational interviewing. Uh, uh, like I said, we were, we started to learn that this, these, these, this kind of training is probably has higher value in terms of uh, it, like overall impact and equipping our, our, our uh, train, our, our liaisons with those sort of skills uh, uh, is sort of, is sort of like an exciting prospect, especially if we give them uh, really formal skills. We did, we did uh, sort of hire four people with this uh, patient engagement um, in their, in the history uh, so that they've had this like patient customer facing uh, uh, roles in the past. But I think uh, going forward, uh, I've mentioned before that the learnings from this uh, uh, engagement with New York Health Foundation is informing our, our future work. We've actually uh, intentionally budded, budgeted uh, training for uh, more about what, what Urvashi had mentioned, like this sort of uh, customer facing um, uh, 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 skills and things like that. One thing I would add, um, Ellie, without <laughs> Uh, pushing another organization that I worked for at one point, but there are CHW trainings uh, out there, certified trainings out there. Um, I know, I, I'm not sure actually what Air NYC uses or if you train internally, but there are some offered through community-based colleges here in New York City. I would, I would urge others in other parts of the state to look for their local CHWs. I know I can speak specifically to LaGuardia Community Colleges program um, that touches on all of these foundational skills that people are talking about. Um, around community engagement and patient engagement, motivational interviewing. There is a um, course all about kind of chronic diseases that just gives like high level, what is heart disease? How do you manage it? What is HIV? What is the, you know, common to, you know, medications today and importance of adherence. And then they did add on a, a technology course uh, around EMR and documentation. And so those, I'm sure those are offered by other community colleges or facilities uh, in and around New York City and New York State. So um, I don't believe there is a certification as like there would be for a peer certification, um, you know, but there, there are, you do get a certificate at the end. And I hired former CHWs who graduated from that program as patient navigators and other programs. So it is a, it is an option for, for those of you on this call today who are saying, oh, I can't train these myself. There, there are programs out there and, and maybe Ali, that might be something we can share as a resource. Yeah. 
Yeah, please do. And also thanks to folks in our chat for sharing their resources around CHW trainings in different parts of the state and for sharing your experiences with CHW programs and bringing on CHWs into your care team. I see another question in the chat, which is, Keenan, I'm going to start with you. So take a breath for a second. And then it's perfectly positioned to have you explain your health and hospitals work as well as Air NYC and EngageWell's work around the metrics that you capture for these projects and what that means for how you can assess the reach of patient navigators and the impact that patient navigators have in helping patients use telehealth and other forms of technology. So we share a bit about your evaluation or, and all of you, your current data capture underway or even your plans for evaluation moving forward. But Keenan, I'll start with you. Yeah, of course. And um, I will uh, specifically shout out my partner in this, and, and that's Kevin Chen. He's on the call. And uh, I'll actually share some of his work in the chat uh, once I finish talking. Uh, but uh, part built into the, our engagement was tracking um, uh, the outcomes. Um, for example, we have our our, our patient portal liaisons uh, or the the video the telehealth navigators uh, make calls uh, to folks who have missed uh, uh, telehealth navigators for whatever reason. Um, on and then uh, for for folks who had successful telehealth navig uh, 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 telehealth encounters, and then who uh, folks who uh, uh, what's uh, 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 are scheduled uh, for a telehealth navigator or, or telehealth appointment in the future. And we have questions that we run through with them. Uh, a lot of them are subjective um, to sort of understand, especially the folks who had missed the calls to sort of understand what, what exactly the barrier was. Um, and sometimes we uncover issues. And, and this is sort of where I we, we get into sort of like uh, foundational and like sort of like unstructured problems as this is a totally completely new workflow and we're dealing with both patient and provider biases. Uh, you know, when you go to a clinic, it's a unidirectional relationship that the patient goes there. But, you know, when you have, when you arrange for a telehealth appointment, it's bi-directional, the, the provider has to meet the patient for halfway. Uh, so sometimes we find that, you know, a patient will get to the halfway point, but the provider didn't meet them there. So what's, where's the issue there? And, and our, and our navigators help with that too. So they can, intervene when they when they call these patients and they ask them what happened they say well our our, our doctor was uh you know didn't make it uh we i was on the phone for two hours and and nobody called me back etc well let's find out why um there's there no is there no uh you know infrastructure in place to call back that patient if there's a miss so uh we have those sort of data capture points um, uh, built in, and we track our video visit success rate at all, all our facilities. We track how what percent are scheduled as video, and then what percent are completed as video. And uh, we try to measure. We're trying to measure. Well, I'll say Kevin is trying to measure the the uh, the uh, the impact once a once a uh, after a navigator was at a specific facility to see if that pr proportion of video visits completed does increase. Um, but I will just say, uh, you know, kind of uh, wrapping this all up, um, uh, Kevin did some work looking at Prescani stores scores after uh, a calls, and he does find that patients uh, Prescani scores are the highest satisfaction are with video visits compared to audio and inpatient. So there's a lot of value. We we know that patients want this to be successful, so we have to build out the whole infrastructure to make it successful. And I'll post that link in the chat uh, right now. Thanks, Keenan. There's a, a ton of rich data out there to share what this means for patients, what the potential is, and what barriers stand in the way. So I'd encourage everyone to take a look. Um, Irvishi, I'd love to head to you next and hear about the metrics that you and Sun River collaboratively are capturing and how what you're finding out, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, has helped you to pivot the program over time to meet patient needs. And then lastly, Chris, will talk about your really thoughtful plans for evaluation. Yeah, so um, throughout the project, we've been kind of documenting everything that the patient is um, telling us, uh, CHW in terms of what they need and what they're interested in. So we, we track that. And then whenever possible, we're always tracking um, to get to close loop referrals, especially um, as they are concerned um, regarding social needs. Um, so throughout this documentation process, we've learned a lot and we've been able to advocate better for telehealth visits when desired by patients. There's been also a lot of informal learning and feedback from CHWs about um, what the patients are really saying on the call. So 
Um, I think with the population that we've been working with, some of the patients that uh, we serve are more transient, um, maybe experiencing homelessness. So, um, you know, it's not always the right fit for them to, or for us to really um, push telehealth, right? And they really um, would like to make more of that connection back in person at the clinic. So whatever we can do to get them connected back to care, that's what we will do. So um, we're always documenting, right? When the CHW schedules an appointment or helps the patient schedule an appointment, um, we're providing patient level data back to Sun River, as well as some aggregate metrics on you know, uh, totals and percentages of um, those that we're working with that are interested in telehealth. Um, and then, you know, collaborating with Sun River to see, okay, out of those that we scheduled, um, has this been having an impact on those that are actually attending their appointments? So um, the collaboration between us and Sun River has been really key to understanding and helping to inform, um, you know, just generally um, for providers, how much uh, telehealth really should be available. And I know this is a balance that in general, the healthcare ecosystem is trying to strike right now as we are moving into this um, sort of phase of the pandemic and the current um, world that we live in right now. This is a loaded question, Allie. <laughs> so um, I think, yeah, we we have we brought on Columbia University with some support from New York Health Foundation and Altman Foundation because we had to wrap our mind around what should we be evaluating, and we want to we want to do this in kind of a researchy way, right? Baseline, six months in, twelve months in, and then <clears throat> post project. So part of this is integrating into each of the digital health applications um, a, a client survey or or a qualitative survey that will um, actually track comfort with digital health or telehealth services over time. Um, we're kind of calling it a digital health literacy survey. Um, so some basic questions around confidence in using the tool, um, uh, your ability to use the tool, your, your satisfaction with the tool. And this is in addition to the surveys that the platforms will likely push out themselves. A lot of people use, or a lot of our, our, our partners are using net promoter scores or an NPS that how likely are you to recommend this tool to, to a family member or a friend, but we really wanted to get a little bit deeper about um, your comfort with the tool itself. And so we're designing those surveys with, um, you know, the expertise of Columbia University, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, there's a whole, it would be because our eyes are set on, um, kind of sustaining this three years from now. We are also thinking about how can we collect data around return on investment? What is the impact, not just on patient satisfaction, the qualitative is important, but some of the hard quantitative relationships between the platform or the, the digital health tool and health outcomes. And that's a little bit harder to do, right? It's it's tapping into claims data, it's tapping into um, health data that's collected through our healthcare providers. So, you know, what we've done is each provider that is participating in the project is identifying a, a cohort of clients with a, a, with a, a unifying uh, health concern. So maybe it's HIV or maybe it's heart disease or it's diabetes and we'll be collecting quarterly, you know, rel related health outcomes. So adherence data, medication adherence data, or viral load suppression for people with HIV, or A1C levels, or, or diet, um, self-reported diet and intake. So it's because the project is so diverse with the number of patient populations, it is a little bit um, tailored to the population we're, we're working on, but we do want to make sure that we are, it, it's our it's never gonna be a solid line between kind of digital health intervention and positive health outcome. I mean, that would be great, but we wanna make that as solid of a line as possible. We really do think that it's not, you know, collecting the qualitative piece is important as well from the peer themselves. So we anticipate putting our peers through their own, uh, you know, qualitative uh, interviews to understand how they feel satisfied about their role, how they feel they relate to their patients or their clients and the support that they're providing. We will also be um, selecting, uh, not in a randomized control, control trial, but in a, you know, a subset of patients and providing them small um, $25 gift cards to talk with, with peers who will be trained by Columbia on how to 
do more structured interviews to say, how has this impacted your life? So we are really thinking about this holistically at this point. Uh, we need more, <laughs> more resources to do it well, um, but we, we're lucky in that the apps themselves collect some of this data for us and are ingesting that on our behalf. And so, it, yeah, we're, we're trying to think really broadly about this, but in the mindset of value-based payment, where we need to prove that these things reduce cost of care, we're trying to make that uh, case by the end of the year, uh, sorry, end of year three, to say that these are, make patients happier and healthier, and this is why, and that's, if you give us this much managed care, you'll get this much back. So we are really thinking about this kind of in the immediate and long-term from an evaluation standpoint. Um, I'm oh, sorry, Ali. I, there's something else I just wanted to mention as well is that one of the um, key benefits that we've noted from working with a community health center like Center for QHC is that while we've been um, sharing back our metrics with them, they're looking at key health outcomes for those that are utilizing telehealth versus those that are um, coming to the clinic in person. And they're taking these learnings from a clinical quality assurance perspective and building it into their scheduling kind of in real time as we're providing this feedback. So this is the scheduling that the community health workers are then plugging into. So that sort of feedback loop has been really, really helpful as well. So um, we're also in um, the process of piloting a telehealth survey um, to better understand patient attitudes towards telehealth and the types of support that they need, as well as the types of um, appointments that they would want telehealth for versus the types of appointments that they'd like to go to the clinic in person for. So we'll be sharing this as well with Sun River Health. Thank you all. There's such a richness in what you shared in terms of capturing patient feedback, capturing how this works in the clinical workflow, pivoting in real time the projects or setting it up for success as a foundation years to come. So such depth to that I wish we could dig in further to there. I wanted to pull on a thread that you all mentioned around the instances when telehealth can be a really effective mode of care. Telehealth is positioned to work well in some instances and some not for marginalized patients and sometimes and not in others. Keenan, you brought up the really powerful example around your patients from immigrant communities feeling like this is a lesser form of care. Urbishi, you mentioned in Sun Rivers and your patients from that experiencing homelessness, challenges with privacy there. Chris, I know your members are people living with HIV, people needing treatment for mental health conditions and substance use disorders. So talk with us about your experiences over the course of your projects on when patients are seeking telehealth or where it may not be the right fit for them in their care in this moment in time. And if, if you see any opportunities where telehealth could be an effective mode of care, and we have yet to realize that potential. See, who should I start with? Uh, Keenan, you brought up the quote first. Why don't we go there and then Urbishi and Chris? Yeah, so this, this synchronizes pretty well because it was actually our, our telehealth navigator that brought this piece of information to us. And it was kind of a revelation with it in and of itself. Uh, so one of the things that we feel like makes telehealth successful, um, you know, we have like three branches. Is One is like the, the foundation. Can you does a provider have a panel that's appropriate for telehealth? And that's its own issue. Resources, every site has its own resources and that's its own issue. And then uh, the use cases. Uh, and we never really thought about this, but we have to think really intentionally about what is, a what is an appropriate patient for telehealth? And uh, our telehealth navigator was rotating through one of the sites when she was talking to a neurologist who had printed out a sort of workflow for stroke. And it had like a very specific um, uh, uh, sort of triage of, so for patients uh, so that patients who are really telehealth appropriate, um, not only in diagnosis, but in demographic and, and comfortability and, and follow-up um, everything sort of had to check every boxes. And what we find is that this, this clinic with this workflow does something like 20% more successful video visits than all the other neurology stroke uh, clinics. So this piece is really important. So we have to think about, you know, not only from a diagnosis perspective, what's a, what's an appropriate uh, use case for, for, for telehealth. And then uh, from a patient perspective, are, are, are they going to have issues with, with the phone? Um, uh, do they have the resources available? Is this a new patient? Like, do you really want to do a, a new patient as, you know, what's, what's the context of the visit? So let's, let's flesh that out. And that's something that our telehealth navigator brought to us. And, and, and that's, you know, one of the big learnings of this engagement. Yeah, thanks, Keenan. Um, 
Additionally, what we've, you know, our, our intervention has been more focused on primary care patients at Sun River, but we have just generally learned through um, discussions with our partners that uptake around telehealth has been more successful to play on the behavioral health side. Um, and of course, um, telehealth eligibility um, can vary based on the patient's condition and when they've last been in the clinic. So we always have to kind of keep that in mind um, when we're engaging patients. Um, but just generally, um, telehealth can be a better modality for patients that are already engaged in care, as opposed to patients that might have a history of not um, showing um, to appointments. But I also wanted to mention an initiative of Sun River Health that involves um, them going out into the communities and they have these kiosk events where they set up and this is actually geared towards folks experiencing homelessness. So there's a bit of a divide right there. For some experiencing homelessness, telehealth might not be an appropriate intervention, but um, Sun River is also providing that opportunity for folks um, out there to get connected to a provider. So they go out in the community and they set up um, a tent where you know folks are able to have that privacy and connect to a provider via telehealth. So um, is, that's definitely an interesting initiative that they are piloting right now. Yeah, I, I would. This is a tough question to answer um, because we haven't started implementing some of these digital health platforms. But I will say, and this is kind of a separate project, the IPA. Um, participated in, and it was a traditional telehealth intervention where COVID hit, we needed to make sure we got into the hands of patients, uh, plat a platform that was reliable. Um, but I will say some of the providers did take this kiosk approach um, to setting up, you know, we were, the IPA was able to provide tablets and um, with, with funding from FCC, emergency funding from FCC, and they did take this approach of setting up kiosks so that, um, a patient, if they had to come in or wanted to come in, could connect with providers across the network. I will say it's just from that project, it was, you know, we haven't come up with a great solution for patients who are unstably housed or who are, you know, living in shelter. Um, some of these uh, applications do require, you know, we're delivering food to the patient's home, for instance, they need a reliable place to receive that food. Um, the the smartphone getting the hands into a the uh, to the patient or or a client it you know it, it takes two weeks sometimes to get that phone placed the order and so sometimes the client is gone or they relocated so um, I would also say that in some of our drop in centers we're really focused on support for people with behavioral health conditions substance use disorder we haven't really seen um, buy-in or opt-in to those projects because it's just a more, it's one additional barrier. Like they're not really worried about getting a food box delivered to their home. They're worried about preventing an overdose. And so there are times where some of these special population special needs, this isn't a good fit. Um, but I will say what's nice about our project and what we're excited about is because of the diversity in our network where it's primary care, behavioral health care, uh, health home care management, outpatients, you know, social determinants of health programs, we we're able to, we're, we're hoping to demonstrate how this is replicable in a diverse setting and where this might work better or best is one of the questions that we will be evaluating. Um, but I will say that it has, you know, it's it telehealth isn't for everybody and for um, uh, we would love to be able to bring this to, you know, a, sh a shelter system and, 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 and use this as a, a guide into FQHC or primary care. It was actually a project we were hoping to fund with uh, our current FCC funding and it just didn't, um, just didn't get picked up. So it is something that we, I think with the 1115 waiver focused on supportive housing might be an interesting use case for telehealth as a, as a um, link to primary care or outpatient care. That's great. Thank you all so much. We're coming up on five minutes left. So what I'm going to do is try and wrap a bunch of the remaining questions in the chat into one. I won't be able to get to the question on billing code. So if any of our panelists or participants on the call have thoughts as to billing codes for telehealth, digital literacy, or otherwise, drop that knowledge in the chat. Uh, but as to our last question, I'm going to ask a big question with just three minutes remaining. So just give us your high level thoughts or your first impressions. But folks have been talking in the chat around ways that technology can be used to support health needs outside of the very traditional definition of telehealth of an appointment and logging on and seeking that care. Can it be used in home-based settings? Can it be used, Chris, in your model around providing nutrition counseling and food assistance? So 
give us your thoughts, Chris, I'm going to start with you as to what other creative modes of using technology to support meeting people's health needs are out there that we can be thinking about beyond the traditional telehealth approach. Yeah, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be part of this panel today because a lot of what I've been talking about has been more of a, a digital health or health application. And so, yeah, we are partnering with Tangelo. They are a, um, a smartphone based application that enables a, a low income patient or a patient to order healthy food that's delivered right to their home. You know, the caveat being uh, we're using foundation funds to support the technology, the analytics, the referral, the assessment component of it, but the food is something we have fund raised funds to, to cover, but they will be getting two boxes delivered to their home twice a month. Um, they get to choose what's in that box. We were thinking about some patients um, or clients uh, don't know how to cook. And so we're making sure we offering a curated box that can be opened and eaten. So think, you know, hummus and carrots or, or uh, something along those lines. And then a more like microwavable option for patients who might have access to a microwave, but not a kitchen um, in, a, in a congregate setting. And then kind of a, a box that comes with all the you know, ingredients you would need to make a feast. And so we're, you know, that's a really exciting pro program. And again, uh, they can use SNAP benefits in the curated marketplace. I, I could talk about tangible for a while. And then regards, we have a medication adherence application too that, you know, is uh, we often rely on self-reports and understand if someone's taking their medications, this is one step closer to helping understand what is happening kind of in a remote patient monitoring setting. So, you know, yeah, the patient takes a picture of the medications in their hand with our partnership wealth. They upload that picture that becomes the proxy for adherence. Yes, the patient could throw those pills in the toilet or, or you know, throw them away. But if you're taking the time to open your pill box, put them in your hand, take a picture, upload that picture and you get a small $2 incentive for doing so, we think you're taking your meds. And what's nice about that is you get a weekly report on whether or not someone has done this activity. And so it's better than saying, did you take them? You actually have something to point to. And our care managers are excited about that to say, wow, you haven't used the app this week. Did you take your medications? Or is it a, you know, uh, you just don't know how to use it. So yeah, we're getting, to, we're, we're trying to tie this to kind of social determinants of health, not just primary care or behavioral health settings. All right, time has flown. We have just a minute left, but Urvashi and Keenan, if there are any burning thoughts you have on the topic, please chime in. Sure, I mean, we're always getting creative about how we can use technology to reach our patients and get them connected to resources. So something I'll mention, for example, um, Community health workers have conducted video visits um, to assess the environmental condition of apartments in the past, and that has helped them facilitate referrals for uh, repairs in the home or get the right folks in. Also, like uh, Chris mentioned, um, related to medication adherence, it's really helpful for um, folks, especially um, I'll use the asthma example for them to understand, you know, which inhalers they need to take, how they should take it, and the CHW is able to demonstrate that. Um, the last thing I'll mention is also when it comes to benefits applications for different social needs, um, being there with the patient as they're filling out the form or this community health worker sharing the screen can really help make that process a lot um, more easy to understand for the patient as they're navigating through this um, environment that can be really challenging. Oh, Keenan, you're muted. Yeah, the last 10 seconds, I'll just say uh, we're working a lot on remote patient monitoring, uh, making sure that, you know, we, we can give patients devices uh, to manage chronic diseases uh, at home. You know, a, patient, a provider sees a patient for once and then may not see them for a year. So maybe we can get some insight on what's happening at home. So that's a, Thank you. A of, Thank you yeah. all. I want to just plug in real quick. A, su a surprising funder for us has been the Federal Communications Commission (FCC). I mean, it's 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 a it's a federal program, and everyone knows what federal grants are like, so it is a challenge. But they have some really exciting um, uh, projects around rural health care or Healthcare Connect Fund, where they can offer routers and Wi-Fi for free or low cost to rural people living in rural areas or low-income patients. Um, that's exactly what's funding our Connected Care pilot program. Now there's the Life program, which can offer um, support for a landline or for free Wi-Fi. So I presented, or I, I shared assurancewireless.com. I believe that's the New York City version of, of Lifeline here, where you can get a, a free phone with data and Wi-Fi um, included. So there are ways to get broadband into the hands of people. You just need to, you know, but I would start with the FCC. They have some really exciting nationwide programs. Thank you all. Gosh, we just scratched the surface. There's so much more to talk about, but I will say, 
Thank you everyone for joining us. You brought your experiences and your questions in the chat. Many, many thanks for our panelists. Now everybody gets to see why I'm so excited to work with you every day. And I'll just say, as for a recap, we'll be sending out the materials from a slide shortly thereafter. Keep in touch with us through our newsletter and our other forms of social media and media to understand what our great grantee partners are up to and what we are up to. And we will look forward to the next time we get to connect on this and any other exciting topic in patient engagement. So thank you, everyone.